and to dive into the history of Egypt, where um, uh, we are going to say it's very rich. Each and every period has its own features, its own uh, special names, its own um, uh, people who wrote uh, this history, and it's not uh, going to be forgotten. But from time to time, we should remind our people that uh, uh, we do have this kind of history, and today it's about Eubian or Eubid, I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, Cairo. Um, this period of time was very rich. And uh, as usual, we are going to have a historian who are going to tell us more. Mr. Samir Abbas, thank you very much for being with us, sir. Glad, glad to be with you today. Good morning, uh, Dr. Abbas. And uh, let's first talk about the origin of the Ayyubid uh, dynasty. How did it uh, um, start off? You know, first of all, and uh, we are talking about the Islamic history in general. Mm -hmm. And the Ayyubid uh, dynasty started as, um, um, as a re reflection or as... Um, um, the consequences of the Crusaders campaigns in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. So that was a big challenge of the Middle East, the Crusaders campaigns, and the Crusaders campaigns, they have advantage of the divided uh, Muslim power in mm -hmm. that time. We are talking about nearly around 11th, 12th century, and there was a rise of a new dynasty, and the new dynasty was based in Iraq and called Iraq. That was Nuruddin Mahmoud and his descendants after that, which is Salah al-Din, is actually comes from the same dynasty. Mm -hmm. And in that time, the Muslim power was uh, has been divided between the Fatimid and uh, the Fatimid that was in the north coast of Africa, and the Abbasid in Baghdad and Hejaz area. Mm -hmm. uh, because of these divisions, the Crusaders campaigns uh, took advantage of the situation and took over the Holy Land, which is Jerusalem. And that was a big alert, and that encouraged uh, Nur al-Din Mahmoud and Salah al-Din later on to uh, unify between the Muslim powers to build a strong army so they can uh, liberate uh, the Holy Land. That is the historical reason behind the foundation of the Ayyubid dynasty. There was a serious problem. And why Cairo was uh, the capital for the very first part uh, or the very first period of the Ayyubid dynasty? So uh, actually... Uh, because it moved after that to Aleppo or to Halab in Syria. To Halab. So uh, most of their operation that was in Syria. You know, mm -hmm. And the same, like they said, that we have the one of the famous attractions. We will talk about it more in more details from the Ayyubid dynasty. In and they were of uh, Kurdish origin as far as of I remember. Of Kur Kurdish origin, yes. Yeah. So they were a similar citadel in Syria as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And uh, Salah al he might have more interest, more strategic, more strategic reasons, you know, to boot more uh, more interest in the Syrian front because that was uh, close to the Crusaders. But just giving a small note about the Crusaders because mm -hmm. uh, the interesting thing about the Crusaders is that this name not given to them unle until the 17th, 18th century, not mm -hmm. before. Before that time, they called themselves the European armies and they were sh leading a holy war against the Middle East to take the holy land back. Mm. And uh, they make a very good uh, media propaganda mm -hmm. for uh, media propaganda for their campaigns, you know, based on false news about uh, about how the Christian pilgrims treated in, in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And that's, by the way, that's an, that's an eye of, of uh, the contemporary European historians, not even the Arab historians, the mm -hmm. European historians, they are claiming the uh, European armies, the Crusaders, as not fair in dealing, in dealing with this case. And even some of the European historians today, they said that uh, the main reason of European or the Crusader campaigns, it had nothing to do with the religion, it was mainly because of economy. There was a collapsing economy in Europe at the time, high inflation rate, and that was the best way to uh, divert the public opinion away the inner problem by creating a war uh, elsewhere. So, and the map we have it now is the map of historical Cairo. And historical Cairo, as we know it, it has four different quarters, the Fustat, al Askar, al Qata'a, and the fourth quarter is Cairo. Mm -hmm. That was all, or Qahira, uh, that was all built before Salah al-Din to made to Egypt. Mm -hmm. And Salah al dins contributions to that is to build a wall. Instead of having each one of these quarters has a wall on its own, he built a wall to contain or to put all of the four quarters together in mm -hmm. one district and one city. And that is his big, big contribution. And there was a key element in this wall that was a citadel, which mm. is he built it in order to protect the entire city. So uh, the location, you know, talking about the citadel, the citadel is 
the most important uh, attractions or historical building from the Ayyubid dynasty in Egypt. And we are talking about around 1172 or 12th century when it was built. Right. Uh, Dr. Abbas, uh, if you could tell us about the uh, cultural background of the Ayyubid uh, dynasty, how did it look like? What were the, the special traits of the Ayyubid family? So in that time, that was this, the division between Sunni and Shia, which is, that was already happened. Mm -hmm. And the Fatimites they were known as Shia. And Salah didn't introduce himself as a Sunni. Uh, the Abbasid Khalifa in Baghdad, he was still in power, but lost Egypt and North Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, Salah al-Din, because of the, uh, for religious, for religious reason, he was more loyal to the Abbasid Khalifa in Baghdad. And uh, when he made it to Egypt, he made it as a prime minister of the mm -hmm. Fatimid king, by the way, the Shia king. And shortly after, if, uh, when, once he became into power, he, um, he raised the name of the Khalifa, of the Abbasid Khalifa, the Sunni one, on Al-Azhar, uh, which mm -hmm. is that was a mosque uh, to promote the Shia teachings at that time. And that was marking the end, uh, the end of the Fatimid Shia dynasty in Egypt. So that is the most important thing when it comes to the the culture of the Ayyubic in that time, which is uh, the role they played, you know, in the, in the um, uh, divisions between Sun Sunni and Shia and how they... So let me Sunni. take it from here since you were talking about Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, sir. As you, uh, as you know, history is not written all the time in a neutral or an, or an, in an objective way. Mm -hmm. Many historians are, are um, when it comes to people, they are uh, writing about them according to their own impression or how they are seeing them, they were seeing mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I, and I don't know why, if, uh, if this is um, made on purpose or, I mean, intentionally or non-intentionally, many voices now are saying that Salah al-Din al in specific, was a man of blood. And he mm -hmm. was, he committed massacres, mm -hmm. and especially in Egypt. So. If this was, if this is true, because I really, cannot understand how, uh, how we are all the time uh, studying Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi as a hero, the only leader, to be accurate, who was able to save Al-Quds or Jerusalem and in the same time to have another side of the coin saying that he is a killer. So, you know, first of all, I totally agree with you about the history is like an opinion. Mm -hmm. and when it comes to people, not incidents. Definitely, you know, and, and that's how we know the history, by the way, you know, because nobody of us which has lived life long enough to trace uh, mm -hmm. historical events a long thousand of years. Mm -hmm. uh, there is, I will give you just an example before turning to Salah al uh, Alexander. Uh, once we mention the word Alexander, what normally comes to your mind? Alexander the Great, mm -hmm. Alexander al Akbar, which is, that's, that's from my perspective, the only reason he, he was called Alexander the Great because the history was written by the historians, which is made very well from his own backgrounds. Mm -hmm. But he was, that was a great massacre, you know, that he, he was really a tyrant, and he wiped the entire villages in his campaigns. Anyway, moving to Salah al-Din, I totally agree with you in the point that the history is like an opinion and have an influence, influence by the history writers. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in our search about to get as close as possible from what happens in reality, which is, it is nearly impossible to know exactly what happens in reality, but we have to get different resources from a neutral, uh, sorry, from a neutral perspective. Not only from our backgrounds, from Western backgrounds as well. And uh, the interesting thing that there is many of the, uh, um, like fair Western historians, they are giving a high credit to Salah al-Din for his good values in life and for what he, what he've done for uh, religious tolerance in Jerusalem. They even said that Salah al-Din is much more tolerant than other kings, uh, European kings, they were controlling Jerusalem before, before him. And that's, of course, that's a big subject to talk about, but uh, European historians, you know, they claim that Salah al-Din, you know, so, you know, those who are calling Salah al-Din, he was a bloody massacre, they might have a political agenda, you know, for uh, not only against this era, but again, it's the whole Islamic era. Unfortunately, the word Islam now, when it was handled, when it handled in the Western media, it's unfortunately it is always associated with blood, with massacre, with suicide rumors, with a very negative views. And mm -hmm. that was part of the agenda as well, to uh, even to choose one of the most important leaders, which is highly appreciated, not only by Muslims, 
mm. even by world leaders and to attach negative uh, negative thoughts to it um, and there is there is an old movie which is uh, known as King Kingdom of Heaven that is made in England that's an English movie an old one that was from nearly 12 years ago that is made by completely Western productions and they are showing a very good examples of how uh, Salah al-Din as a leader, as a uh, religious tolerance, you know, was there. And that was an example of some neutral resources. Mm -hmm. Where was he buried and who succeeded him? I mean, you the know, rulers... As far as you know, he was buried in, uh, in Syria. I don't know exactly where he's buried, to be honest, but as far as I know, he, he was buried in Syria. Mm -hmm. And succeeded him, actually, that was his brother, Kamil, in Egypt. And one of their most important achievements if, in Egypt, apart from the wall, is also the citadel. But before talking about the citadel, which is an you know, important thing, and I wish we can have some of the illustrations, which is a good for the citadel and the buildings inside. Uh, one of the great achievements of Salah al din from my understanding, is he his main focus to get people together, mm -hmm. not to fight them. And that's a huge difference between the thoughts of uh, and the philosophy and the strategy of the Fatimite be before him and, and Salah al din So the Fatimite, for example, when they built Cairo or Cahira as a new royal quarter, they went far away from all of the other quarters. When you look at the historical map of Cairo, so the Fustat al Askar Qata'a that was built around mm -hmm. the area of like uh, old Cairo now, and they went in the far northeast to build their quarter. Of course, it is not a big distance now because cars and mm -hmm. modern, like, uh, modern life. Uh, and and they built a w they built a wall and they dedicated only for their army. So that's one of the walls of the citadel. Mm -hmm. Because when we mention the citadel, some people wrongly uh, think that it was built by Muhammad Ali because the famous mosque inside is Muhammad mm -hmm. Ali Mosque. And uh, but actually it's built by Salah al-Din and completed by his like descendants. And mm -hmm. Muhammad Ali he added a new section to the citadel, including his mosque as well. So and as far as I remember, that he was a scientist. A scientist, he was, he and he had a lab, something like that. He was he fond great, of chemistry, in addition to be such a commander, he, he an had army a great, commander. Yeah, he has a great respect for science, and that's one of the good qualities of the good leaders, by the way, which is those who appreciate science, because hmm. when you look at the modern civilizations of the West now, it is based on science, and the modern and the uh, the great Islamic civilization in its old age that was based on knowledge and science. So. Uh, Salah al main quality, he'd like to bring people together. Instead of having a civic and building a new quarter and, build and putting his army like the Fatimites did, no, he built, uh, he said we have already four quarters and he built a wall around them to put all of them together, uh, together, uh, unlike the previous rulers. Mm -hmm. So, uh, talking about the citadel, if you'd like to, to dedicate some time for that, uh, <coughs> uh, the citadel itself, is uh, the location is uh, a genius location for mm -hmm. choosing you know, the location of the citadel when you look at cairo cairo is very well protected by the Nile river from the west and a limestone ridge called mm -hmm. the mukattam is not a mountain by the way and to the northern plateau it is a limestone ridge and uh, that was giving like a natural defense line for cairo from the east mm -hmm. uh, that makes any army would like to invade Egypt from the northeast, which is most of the armies invaded Egypt, by the way, in the history, in the whole, whole history, from the northeast. They have to come between the mountain and the spur from the mountain, which is that's where he chose to build the citadel. Mm -hmm. So, and it will be a very easy target then. And the location is high enough to have a very good control of the army route, you know, of any army army invading, invading Egypt, it was kept maintained, renovated, and because of strategic importance, still the police and still our army still have the camps inside mm -hmm. uh, the citadel until today. Yeah. So as we are all the time saying our history is that rich and we cannot contain any dynasty in episodes, we need years to come. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Sami Abbas, our historian, thank you very much for your input, exactly. sir, and have a very today. good day. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Have a good day. And uh, I guess this is where we end this edition of The Breakfast Show. My name is Dina Hussain. Uh, I've enjoyed very much your company and the company also of Nermeen Abdurrahman, uh, my uh, Saturday and Sunday morning partner. Thank you very well, much. It was my pleasure Nermeen. as usual, Dina. And until we see you again tomorrow, uh, that's a goodbye.